Hi, everyone, and welcome to the WEM webinar on Women of Waste. So we have really, really awesome group of ladies here today that will be sharing their experience. So I just have some housekeeping um, rules to highlight to everyone in the, in the audience. So we will be muting all of you and your videos will be turned off for now. But um, towards the end, um, once we have our picture time, then you can actually turn on your cameras. So and this, as this session will be recorded, uh, we, are, we do hope that you mute yourselves. And if you have any questions, please drop it in our chat box and we will get the questions up to our speakers and, um, and our panelists later on uh, during the Q&A session. It's just a bit brief um, on who WMAM are. And, yeah. So we are an NGO founded in 2000, 2005, representing professionals and practitioners across all disciplines, including environment, engineering, and waste management service providers. We are a platform for all stakeholders to contribute their views and expertise, and is affiliated to the International Solid Waste um, Association, ISWA, since 2007 as the national member. Our main objectives is to encourage and promote the development of high standards of waste management services in Malaysia, and also to encourage the collaboration and cooperation between all those involved in the industry. So for today's session, we will begin with Ms. Gunilla Carlson. So she is the organizing board of ISWA, as well as the head of communication, uh, she's director of communications for South Scania Waste Company since 2006. And in, since May 2021, she has taken the role as director of public affairs and international relations. She has also been on the board of executives for the Swedish Association for Waste Management since 2013. And part of the board of directors of South Kenya Waste Company since 2006. So today we have Gunilla. She will be our. She will be giving a keynote uh, speech. So without further ado, please welcome Miss Gunilla to give her opening speech. Thank you very much, and thank you. Uh, I would like to share my screen, so I will start with the technical part, and that is always the most scary part. Um, can I sh share my screen? Is that possible that you can make me a co-host? Yes. Co -host? Okay, give me a second. Can you try to share your screen? Uh, yes, now it works. Awesome. So, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Uh, let's see if we can move this one so you don't have to see that one. So, okay. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies. And I saw that we have some gentlemen here. So good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here to give this keynote speak, uh, speech to you. Uh, as you heard, my name is Gunilla Carlson, and I will try to give you some uh, of my perspectives of the gender situation within the waste management. Uh, I have divided my presentation into three parts. And the first part is very much about myself and the background that I have. The second part is about statistics from Sweden. And the last part is about the gender situation in the waste management in my company, uh, the South Scania Waste Company. Uh, I will finish with uh, some of my own reflections as well. And I will uh, talk a little bit about the communication part because it does have uh, a huge, uh, impact of uh, the gender uh, communication as well, gender and cultural, but I will come back to that. So thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, let's start. Uh, my early background, I would like to start with giving you a view of who I am and where I come from. from. I am grown up in a small village in Sweden, outside Malmö, only 20,000 inhabitants. And I was growing up in a family with two brothers. 
And my mother worked as an educator at the university and my father was a principal at a high school in Malmö. Uh, during my childhood, we had very lively discussions around the dinner table every day. It was about everything and nothing. And it often happened, uh, the, the discussions happened about something that has happened during the days. And my parents were very, very uh, thorough with talking about women's equal rights in the society, cultural differences, and they really treated us three very equally. I was very thorough that uh, my brothers and I had the exact same situation. They didn't do any changes uh, in between us at all. But we had very lively discussion as about all of these uh, issues and every day. We also talk very much about respect, respect for other people, education and experience, because my parents believed that that was the success factors for the future. Uh, when we were a little bit older, the discussions came more and more moved to handle about how to be independent in the society and how to build a strong, strong uh, feeling about the society. And they talked about education and working as earning your own money, and that that was a solution for everyone in the society, not only women, women and men. Uh, this led me to thinking about a lot about my own education and also how I wanted to, to live my life. So I started work very early during the vacations. And my actually first job was when I was 13 years of age, and I started out as a tomato picker. And that was a very funny work. I stepped up very early in the mornings, went to the greenhouse and picking the tomatoes. Uh, it was awful to go up that early in the morning, but it was lovely to finish up at 10 o'clock and then go to the beach and have a lovely day. And that was my first work experience. You work very alone in the greenhouse. You pick the tomatoes. It was a very uh, nice situation. Uh, from the money I earned, I bought my first uh, Thing to my own room and that was actually a stereo because I wanted to have my own not because we didn't have it in the house because I want to have one for my own. The next job I got was as a cleaner in the hospital uh, and that was not so pleasant experience as a woman. I was very young I was 14 years of age when I started to clean at the hospital and the managers at that department was old ladies and they were pro probably not used to being treated equally. So they didn't treat the young girls equal as well. So I started out working on an x-ray department. And on this department, it was only high professors and doctors. And I realized that they didn't treat people equal, uh, even though I believe that everyone is uh, equal in their work. They didn't even say hello when they passed the cleaners in the hallways. And that was an awful situation when you're 14 years of age and you do believe that the life is equal and you realize it's not equal. So I talked to those old ladies, the managers, and they changed the department for me. And they put me in a laboratory instead. And that was even more awful because it was only blood and rats and, and lab, uh, things everywhere. So I did talk to them again and they said, OK, if you are not uh, satisfied with the situation, you can take the basements and clean the waste rooms. So I actually ended up uh, cleaning the waste rooms for one month in the hospital and that was not a pleasant uh, experience when you are 14 years of age and you do believe that everyone is equal in the society. Uh, the next job was at a restaurant as a waitress, and that was much more better. That was better. Uh, people are very happy when you serve them, and with very few people that was not very uh, uh, happy when you are in the restaurant, because they go there and they are eating, actually. When I finished my high school, uh, I started to deliver mails and packages full time, and this was a very good period. Uh, it was equal, though the new ones, not women, it was for all the new ones in the post office. We got the longest tours, we got the worst uh, cases, the heaviest packages and the, the things that the older ones didn't want to do. So that was also, also another experience that if you're young and the 
older ones has been working there for a long time, they wanted to have a little bit better than the young ones. So it was a very hard time, but it was very educational and I learned very much from that. Then I started to work as a post cash cashier. And at this time, uh, I was 22 years old and I, in, for the first time, I reflected on what I really wanted to do in my life. And I did realize from all the works that I had had that I wanted to have a job and an education that made me equal. And I realized I needed to educate myself a little bit more. So I went to the university and I got a, uh, a bachelor degree in media and communications, uh, communication science. And I started out working as a research assistant at the university. I found out that I was still young, I was still a woman, but it was equal and my knowledge counted. So it was a totally different situation then. And when I stopped working as a research assist assistant at the university, I got the first real job and I was a spokesperson, a presenter for a company. So in four months, I gave more than 200 lectures about Swedish pension systems. And that was for a different uh, people out in project production unit. So I was often out on the base floor talking to people. And that was also a real good exp uh, experience. This job later on led me into the communications officer in the, at the regional level in uh, Skåne. And there I worked with crisis communication. I produced newspapers to the inhabitants. And I started up new communication strategies for regional development and international projects. So it was a very diverse time in my career, but it was very fun and I loved it all the way around. At this time, I found out, found out that I really was interested in intercultural communication and differences in the society between both genders and age, cultures, religions. And I found it very educational to, to meet people from from other parts of the world. In 2006, I uh, got my first employment as a manager and that was actually in the waste business. Uh, and when I started in the waste business, I was 35 years of age. I was the youngest woman at the board in my executive, uh, in the board of executives in my company. And I do, if I don't remember wrong, I was one of three women in a group of 10 men and all the men has been working in the company for a long time. Uh, not only was I the youngest uh, woman at the board of executive, I also thought uh, very much of how to develop the strategic part of the communication. And that was a new angle for the company to work more strategically, strategically with the communication. So it ended up that I really, uh, I questioned a lot of the previous way of how they had done the communication, but it ended up very well. So in, uh, in 2006, the department had two employees and in 2014, I was the manager of the communication and IT department with 18 employees. And the last year when I left my department to uh, the next communication manager in SUSA, I had uh, eight uh, nine people working for me and the IT was separated to another department. It's quite uh, different uh, to work with IT and communication. At this time, I am the director of public affairs and international relations in my company. I work very close to the uh, CEO in my company and also the senior advisory. In my experience, there is not only difference in how women and men interact in the waste business, uh, it is also a difference between the age, the culture and the life situation. To be a young woman in a company where 80% is men and have been worked there for a very long time is a little bit special. So in my experience, uh, that was how you can work with different positions and refer to those with your own experience. And I believe that trust, uh, I gained the trust from very many because I had so many different things with me in my package. I had worked really on the base floor with the waste management at the university, uh, at the hospital. I had done the tomato picking, I have done the waitressing, and I had been in so many different places and experience. I think that that was the success 
in how I gained the trust and could develop the communication in my company and uh, in the, my department. So that was a little bit about me and the background. And now I want to give you a little bit about uh, statistics from Sweden. And uh, this is actually the Swedish flag, if you haven't seen it before. It's blue and yellow, and we are very proud of it. Uh, if we go to the statistics uh, directly, uh, in Sweden, if you take it in general, this is of course a statistics that comes from the Central Statistics Bureau. So it differs, that could be both lower and higher. But in general, women in Sweden have higher education levels than men. And this is quite interesting, and I will come back to that. When women choose education in, uh, in uh, uh, early school, in elementary school, they often choose variants uh, so they can, can go to the university in the future. And statistics also show that if you have parents that have a high uh, education, university education, the children more often go that way in the same direction and also get a university, direct, uh, university degree. And if you look at the employment rate in Sweden, 87% of the women is today in an employment, but the men, and that's 90%, so a little bit more men in employment than women. If you are born abroad and not in Sweden, it's only 66% of the women that have an employment and men have 78. So there you can see there is a difference between not only uh, gender, it's also where you are born. So there are differences. If we continue to uh, the income level in Sweden, women's income is 83% of men's income. And this is quite interesting because uh, if you look at this graph, I haven't uh, translated it to English, but you can see here, when you are 20 years of age, the income level is approximately the same for women as for men. But very soon, the women's income is lower than men's and it follows all the way until you go uh, retire yourself. So women, women have higher education levels, but they earn less than men during lifetime. And this is a fact. If we continue with the median income for women, and I have trans translated this into ringgit because I thought it was more easy for you to, to know the levels. Uh, there are two levels, 150,000 and 181,000. And from the previous slide, I think you can uh, uh, guess that 150,000 ringgits, that is the women's median salary. And 181,000 is the men's salary. And this is actually the fact as well. If we go to the retirement income, uh, in Sweden, the average retirement age is 64 years. In Europe, it's a little bit lower, but we work very long in Sweden. I don't know why, but we do. Uh, women more often than men works part-time in Sweden. They also stays home with children during maternity leave. They stay home when children are sick and they tend to have more sick leave than men. This is something that we really work with in society to strive to, to make more equal between men and women, but it's still more women that takes more responsibility in the household. And this together makes women's income when retired 69% lower than men's. And that, that's a quite a difference. Uh, I think we can skip that one. Uh, sexual harassment is also a little bit interesting because if you look at men and women in work life, you can see that there are sexual harassment for both men and women. So it's not that it doesn't exist for men, it does exist. But you can see that for women that is younger than 30 years of age, sexual harassment is much, much higher than for men. So we do have differences between the genders in Sweden at this time in 2021. That's the fact. And I also want to just give you this slide. Uh, women live longer than men. So they do have a, a lower income rate, but they live longer uh, after retirement. So that is quite interesting as well. Something to think of if you're a woman in Sweden. 
Now I would like to talk a little bit about gender in waste management because that is also very interesting. And waste management, you can see here is a woman uh, standing at the sack uh, doing something. And I can tell you that this is a very unusual photo that I found. And I found it on the eye stock. It was not from my company because if I took this photo in my company, it would, would probably be a man standing here. I will tell you why. Uh, in South Kenya Waste Company, I just picked some statistics from back, uh, far back, from 2000 and forward. And you can see the uh, number of employees has raised very much during this time. You can see that the women and the men has a different um, part, as we are different to the uh, amount of men and women in the company. Today, at 2020, we are one third women and two third men. But if you look at 2000 to 2010, you have a uh, just zero at the women and you also on, only counted for the men. And that was not obligatory to do that in the annual reports in that time. But from 2015, we are obliged to both put the men's figures as well as the women's figures in the uh, annual reports. But you can still see that from 80% men, we are today 67% men. So we are in a man-dominated man world. And if you look at where you find the men and where you find the women in the company, uh, we can see that we have more women than men working in administrative uh, parts of the company. And the men are mainly working in the operation. And this is actually the fact today as well. So communication, human resources, economy, administration is very... It's not the hard work doing labor work out on the floors. So there are a difference and that's the fact as well. So what have we done in my company in the last uh, couple of years? When I started in 2006, I was around looking at the different departments and actually found quite interesting things. Uh, in some of the departments, they had calendars on the walls and the calendars were with women on them. And that was actually allowed to have them. So we had a discussion with the human resource uh, department and we said, this is not okay. We cannot have calendars on, with women on the walls in the company. It doesn't give the right uh, signals uh, for the employees. So they actually were prohibited uh, in 2000 and I think it was seven, six or seven. Uh, that was quite a discussion as well, not in, the, not in the management, because that was an easy decision to make, but it was a discussion out on the departments, because why should they prohibit what they wanted to have on the walls? It was not a discussion of what was on the calendar, it was a discussion on what they were allowed to do or not to do. But at that time we did realize that we needed to adjust also the income levels. So we have made very thorough uh, analysis of the incomes in the company between men and women. And we have adjusted those so we can see that if you do the same work, you have the same income level. And that is really important. And we have actually been working with, with equality in different ways. We have had seminars and webinars, educations and went through all those parts that you need to do uh, to have an equal work, uh, work environment for the employees. And we absolutely have a zero tolerance for harassment. That is absolutely. But is it really possible to have equality in work life, a total equality between men and women, age and everything else? And in my belief, there are biological differences that we can't change. For instance, women are the ones carrying the children that we can't change. They are taking care of the children the first time after delivery. Uh, that's the fact. Women are often, not always, but often smaller, 
and not that uh, strong, you know. They have uh, different voices. We have a different uh, body. And that is biological differences that is very hard to change. But there are also things that we can change and we can be aware of things. So we can see when things happen and we, if we are educated, we can use our uh, language and body language in different ways. And if we go to the communication as a tool, the body language stands for 93% of what you are telling. The spoken language is only 7%. And if you look at those three pictures, I think I don't have to say what they illustrate. You can read the photos directly to see that you have a sad child, you have an angry boss, you have a very happy person sitting there. And actually the body language is really, really important. And there are differences between the body language between men and women, between cultures, between age uh, and everything. And we need to be aware of that. And some things you can't change and you shouldn't change, change them, but you must be aware. I had one study visit coming into my company. It's like, it's 10 years ago and they came from Saudi Arabia. And I know it was mostly men that came in and they come from a different culture. So I talked to one of my colleagues and said that I know I have a study visit coming in. They are coming from Saudi Arabia. I know that they, they want to know more about the technique in the facilities and you are the manager. So can you please be there? And he was there and we had talked about the cultural differences between men and women. So we had talked in advance and, uh, and uh, decided that I was the main uh, lead of the study visit and he was the technician and when this uh, question and answer started they directly asked the questions to the men and as we had talked about it he was aware so he said yes thank you very much it's uh, I hear what you say but I'm not the one who's answering this question that is Miss Gunilla that we will do that so in that way, we could treat them with respect and we could give them what they wanted in the study visit, but we use our knowledge and the body language and also respect in having one woman and one man during the study visit. So that is one way you can use the knowledge, the communication and, and, uh, and give the people what they need and want in that situation. Uh, it is really important and communication is very many times a tool. Women very often tend to put their head on the side and they also tend to go a little bit high in the voice, but men doesn't do that. They have a very stiff posture and they lower the voice and it's really gone, going through. And that is something that you can train and educate yourself in how to deal with both men and women, age, culture, and religion, because it is a difference. And I believe it's very important to have uh, respect and to gain trust from everyone because we are equal, but we have differences uh, that we bring along. So how do I think that we can get more women into waste management? I believe that we need to talk more about the soft part of the business, not all, only about facilities. We need to talk about sustainability, we need to talk about resources, and we need to make uh, waste management a little bit more uh, accessible for women. We need to respect the biological differences between the genders, but we should strive to have equality all the time, and we should actively search for women to bring into the waste management. It is important to have a dis dispersed work employee situation. Never ever uh, tolerate sexual harassment or discrimination. That is a total zero no in every cases all the time. And I think that it is really, really important to see people as a people, not as somebody that is a gender or age or education or whatever. 
we are all people and we are working together to strive to get a better world. Okay. Thank you very much for listening to this keynote presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gunilla. I think that's a very interesting point. And I do agree, communication is something very, very important. Um, so I'll just open up, the, uh, if you have a bit of time, we'll open up for questions. If um, anyone has any questions, you could ask Gunilla. Yes. Any questions, anyone? Nope. <laughs> Don't worry, she won't bite. No, 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 none of us will bite. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Well, um, yeah, I don't have any questions myself, but thank you so much, Gunilla, for sharing your experience from the beginning up until where you are right now. And I think your experience sharing here today would open up a lot of eyes and everyone here would also see it as a benefit for them. And we can definitely progress. I think we definitely, as, in, as women in the industry, in any industry actually, we can definitely progress and learn from you. And in terms of communication, I think that's something key for all of us as well. Thank you again. Thank so you very much. much. <laughs> and you are welcome to come with the questions afterwards as well. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we'll head on to our panel discussion um, right now. So first I'll introduce our, our moderator, Aditi. So she is the director, uh, technical director in ISWA. She, she joined ISWA in early February 2016 and leads the technical team and is responsible for developing international partnerships and cooperation projects with CCAC, UNEP, and many other organizations. She has a, mas a master's in environmental technology and international affairs from the Vienna University of Technology and Diplomatic Academy of Vienna, where she focused on energy analysis of plastic waste management in her thesis. She has many years of experience addressing environmental issues in both intergovernmental organizations as well as within private um, sectors. So please welcome Aditi. Thank you, Ray, for this kind introduction. Can you hear me? Yeah, very loud and clear. Yes, okay, excellent. And thank you so much, Gunilla. It was really lovely to hear that journey of yours. Um, it, I think it's helping a lot of us, uh, you know, the, the work that you, people like you have done before us it has really helped uh, the sector move along. And uh, Ray, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very, very happy to be part of this event and to be moderating today's exciting uh, discussion. So hello everyone, as uh, Ray introduced me, um, my name is Aditi Ramola and I lead the technical cooperation team at the International Solid Waste Association. Our registration form uh, that Ray had in control of uh, tells us that we had almost 100 people registering for this webinar, which, which is excellent because I think this topic that we are going to be you know, referring to today is, is something that people are interested to hear about. And uh, so without further ado, in a moment, I'm going to introduce you to the speakers we have, and then we move into uh, short panel discussions, uh, after which we have allocated time for a question and answer session for your questions. Uh, so put your thinking caps on as well. Nobody bites. Everyone's uh, really uh, eager to have this dialogue. So um, diving right in. With the release of the IPCC report last week, you must have seen the sixth assessment report that came out. Um, it is quite clear that us humans are causing climate to change. And the report is telling us that the last decade was hotter than any period in the last 125,000 years. So just take a moment to let that sink in. Um, the most abundant greenhouse gas, which is uh, carbon dioxide, CO2, accounts for about two thirds of the GHGs or greenhouse gases, and is largely the product of using fossil fuels, which drives our consumption, it drives our production, essentially it's driving our whole economy. So when businesses focus, focus on sustainability, on recycling, on reusability, on circular economy, we should, play, uh, we should pay close attention and offer them our full support. And so now that brings us to today's webinar, we have with us today three brilliant entrepreneurs. They're working on themes of sustainability and circular economy. 
They come from a variety of interesting backgrounds and experiences. And um, I hope and we hope to learn a lot more about them and the exciting journeys that have brought them to where they are today. So uh, without further ado, um, the first of our three panelists is Miss Nick Susie. Susie is the co-founder of Cloth, uh, which she established in 2013. Cloth aims to be the first organization in Malaysia that provides end-to-end -end solutions to plastic and fabrics in a circular economy. So welcome, Susie. Hi. Um, next, hi. Um, next, we have with us Ms. Kiru Das. Um, Ms. Kiru is the co-founder of EcoQueen. EcoQueen is a conscious marketplace and sells green products online. Uh, welcome to the panel, Kiru. Hi. Thank you. And our third panelist is Ms. Juliana Adam, who is the CEO and founding partner of the Biji Biji Initiative. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, you can correct Hi. me when I'm wrong. Uh, Malaysia, is that okay? Yes, it's fine. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's Malaysia's impact-driven on enterprise focused on championing sustainable living practices. Uh, welcome, Juliana. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, panel. Thank you so much for your time and for being with us. Uh, so it's a pleasure having you here, and um, I would like to dive right in, uh, beginning with Susie first. Um, I would like Susie and then all of you to actually please tell us a little bit about yourself and about your background and experiences, because I gave a very short introduction. All right, sure. Hello. Hi, my name is Susie. Um, I'm from Cloth, a co-founder. Um, my best friend and my partner, Sarah, so we studied together. We're accounting students in Tanaga National, so... After graduating, so we had about 14 years of working experience, but along the way, we got bored of our professions. I was in the finance for four years, and after that, I was in the media for 10 years. So when I was in the media, I, I thought like my life was boring because, as you know, media industry, the mainstream, is a very fake industry. <laughs> so and then um, I was working for the Malaysian International New York Times Malaysia, so that, that was when I was exposed to sustainability. So my best friend and I started that. Um, we established cloth. About seven and a half years ago, now where we are, we have you know, many brands of the cloth. We have cloth care fabric recycling movement. We have cloth textile made from recycled plastic bottle. We're creating, a hopefully, a plastic value chain end-to-end, cradle-to-cradle for um, our nation. And most importantly, our, um, I would say, quite okay um, establishment is that we collected more than 1.65 million kilograms of unwanted fabrics in a span of 35 months, despite there's a pandemic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Susie. That's, uh, that's extremely interesting. Um, and I can't wait to hear more. Um, just briefly turning to Kiru. Kiru, would you tell us uh, more about your past jobs and experiences and the transition to Eco Queen? Sure. Thank you so much, Aditi. And um, well, hi, everybody. So as you mentioned, uh, I am the co-founder for Eco Queen. EcoQueen is a conscious online marketplace. It's uh, very new in the market. We're soon to be launched. Um, and at EcoQueen, what we want to do is we want to offer you personal care and lifestyle products that are sold by local, um, e local eco-friendly and uh, ethical brands, as well as social enterprises. So we want to bring together all these um, businesses under one platform. Um, so before diving into this, um, world of entrepreneurship, uh, which I've been doing this for about um, since the beginning of this year. I had spent quite a few years as a communicator and a marketer. Um, my career actually started off uh, when I joined the media um, as a writer. Um, many years ago as a youth, uh, I joined a youth publication and then I moved on. Um, you know, while I was in the youth publication, I decided I wanted to do something more serious and I moved on to corporate communication. And um, that is where I actually joined um, SWM Environment, which is a waste management company. Um, and I was exposed to the, to the realities of the waste management in Malaysia. Uh, this was nine years ago, and it kind of like sparked my interest, made me want to do more. And um, I continued the journey. Um, I actually joined a nonprofit organization after that. Um, um, the, the organization is called Earthworm Foundation. And um, with Earthworm Foundation, we were working mainly with commodities. And in Malaysia, we were focused on palm oil. So that was, um, you know, my journey uh, towards um, where I am right now. Um, so it was after my stint at um, Earthworm Environment that um, 
sorry, at Earthworm Foundation that I realized that I wanted to do more and uh, had this opportunity to dive into this uh, world of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kiel. That's a, that's a good detailed description of, of a you know, very interesting journey to found Mini Co Queen. Thank you. Um, Juliana, I'd like to turn to you. Uh, would you please tell us a bit more about yourself and how the idea of BGBG came about? Yes, thanks, Aditi. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I am Juliana from BGBG Initiative. You did mention that correctly, pronounce it correctly. Um, so I've been with BGBG uh, since the beginning. So for the past nine years, I've been involved in environmental sustainability and community development kind of works. Um, prior to that, I was in another social enterprise, uh, which was a bit more focused on youth volunteerism. And I've always had a passion for helping people, improving livelihoods, and, uh, you know, and this could be in various forms, like, but since my involvement with uh, BGBG itself, this has been through providing upskilling and opening up new income opportunities for the communities that we work with. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So that was just a brief, uh, you know, get to know each other kind of round. Uh, thank you, uh, all three of you, for walking us through the path that you've taken to where you are today. Uh, but very closely connected to the journeys uh, that you just described is my next question, where I want to know the why and the what. So what drove you to start what you started and, you know, what were your motivations uh, and where do you intend to go with your, uh, with your organizations in the future? Because some of you, as you described, are from entirely different fields. I mean, you've mentioned, um, you've mentioned basically writing for, you know, youth publications, you, you've been doing accounting and so on. So what exactly got you into this? And at this point, I would like to start with Kiru, if I may, um, if you can delve a little bit into the why and the what. Sure. Um, uh, I think um, after graduating, um, you know, uh, I studied media and law and I was thinking, what is next for me? And so I had a whole list of things that I wanted to do. And I was one of them who didn't really have a clear direction of where I was going. So writing was definitely one of the things that I studied. I did media. And so, yeah, I, I dove into that. But then right after that, I, I realized I wanted to do something more. I wanted to work for an organization that was, you know, contributing to something bigger. But I, I didn't have the um, environmental background or, um, or knowledge on um, human rights to actually dive in to do something um, more serious. So um, um, I came across um, this job opening at SWM Environment and I thought it was something really interesting. And I must say that um, that job had really been a pivotal moment for me. Um, it really um, opened my eyes, especially uh, during my first visit to the landfill. Um, I, I realized the, reali the realities, um, you know, how a landfill looks like. Um, how much plastic is there. Um, I was also part of the statistics, you know. Um, it, it never struck to me before this, like I was actually one of the reason I was actually just wasting um, all the plastic and not thinking about the consequences. So that was a moment. And then um, right after that, uh, when I joined uh, Earthworm Foundation and I was working with all these um, big brands, uh, producers, mills, plantations, we're working on um, having responsible supply chain. And at that point, I also realized the consumer trends and how much pressure um, you know, consumers are actually putting and uh, people are actually more interested in having uh, products that are, that are consciously done. Uh, people wanna know where the sources of the products are. Are these actually products uh, from deforestation? Um, so I, I saw the trend in that and it really made me think about what, what I was going to do next. So when this opportunity came, a very good friend of mine, uh, Priya, who's actually an entrepreneur, uh, she came up to me and she said, you know, uh, you always tell me about all these environmental issues and, you know, about getting products that are more sustainable. So why not we start something? We bring this, uh, all the brands uh, that are, produced locally under one platform and uh, let's do this together so that's kind of how um, my journey has been so far that's excellent so uh, so nice to hear that full journey you know from going to a landfill to recognizing or at least in some you know some form saying oh i'm part of the problem and so how do i become part of the solution and so on yeah. That's really inspiring. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Kiru. Um, I would I would like to then turn to Juliana and you know Juliana can tell us more about 
how you chose to start BGBG, you know, what was the motivation, the inspiration? Sure. Um, well, actually, just before BGBG, I had my own startup. Uh, it was called Taboo Enterprise. Um, I started that with my partner, William, uh, where we were conducting upcycling workshops and, uh, you know, looking into sustainable event management. And it was actually from there that we were reintroduced to our old college mates uh, who had just started BGBG at about the same time. Um, it was like well, 10 years ago. So then Taboo and BGBG were actually doing the same thing, uh, which is upcycling. <coughs> things out of waste and wanting to create a movement towards sustainability. So then like uh, me and William met up with our old, old uh, college mates, Rashwin and Gupin and Azam, and you know, our personalities just instantly clicked. Our values were completely aligned. Uh, whatever that we wanted to do, what we uh, wanted to achieve, we were all like uh, heading towards the same direction basically. So it was actually from that first meeting itself that we started working together. Um, from there, it was actually a year of collaboration between uh, Taboo and BGBG, and then we just, you know, decided to absorb, BG, uh, sorry, absorb Taboo into the BGBG company, uh, which then, you know, just reduced our headaches of thinking about branding and marketing and things like that. Um, so from then until today, uh, William and I are both here with BGBG. Uh, William is the director of Taylor's Moreka Makerspace which is a subsidy under our sister company, Mareka, um, that focuses more on the creative education aspect and building the future workforce. Um, I would say like what drove us to where we are is that we all wanted to make a difference. Uh, we wanted people to see the value in waste, um, the impacts that we're creating uh, on the environment and you know how we as people have the power to make a difference. Um, one of the norms that we actually wanted to challenge as well was uh, how business is conducted. Uh, we were actually tired of the uh, bureaucracy working in corporate companies and definitely tired of like, uh, you know, the unfair treatment in wages and profit sharing, things like that. So then um, we got into the business of social entrepreneurship, where we are determined to create a positive uh, impact and uh, a positive environmental and social impact while still making a profit and you know, ensuring that people do get paid fairly for it as well. That is so inspiring, Juliana, that's amazing. Like, you know, several companies, uh, sister companies, and I love the bit that you met, you know, re met your friends or college mates and your values kind of aligned. Uh, that was a very uh, strong statement. So I love, I love that. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that insp inspiring story. Um, I'll move to Susie as well now. Susie, tell us more about Cloth, the idea behind it, the inspiration. The motivation. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go a little bit detailed this time. Okay. All right. How did I myself get into this? I told you that I studied financial accounting. So how I got myself into that, I'll be very honest here, unfiltered, is because of education system. So after high school, so you get certain A's. So after that, you know, I was chosen as a scholar. So I could only study what? Engineering. I could study, I can become an accountant or I was of a lawyer or ICT. I was, I'm 1979 born. So, you know, those were the days whereby, you know, I graduated and it was that in 2002. So I chose accounting. Let me tell you something why accounting, because um, I like to go out. I like to travel with my friends. I know that if I take engineering, it's too difficult. If I take law, I mean, I have to read a lot. You know, I can't party. So the easier low, low hanging fruit that I can have my party life, I can go out, I can travel. It's easiest, it's accounting. And I get a scholarship. So that's exactly what I did. However, something bite me back. Well, I can study accounting with least minimal supervision. I don't really study, but I pass on time, whatever not. I was offered uh, two jobs. Price for the house coopers, EY. I took EY. So after I was in EY, after three or four months, and saying I chartered accountants back then, that was the name. I was always dozing off at my client's place. And you know, in EY, is a top two global firm in the world. And that was like, why am I always dozing off? So it started with being myself, I guess. Like, I can't be bothered about due diligence. I can't be bothered about financial reporting and all. So I'm like, okay, I'm not just being fair to myself. And then I continued to study my chartered secretary with Mr. Malaya, um, while I was in EY. And after that, I know further why I don't want. I don't want to audit or study or calculate people's money. And after that, you know, I was, and then I, I joined and I, I could why, and I was, you know, I did corporate finance, of course, that's a natural progression for any accounting students, right? I did that, again, I was calculating money, and I'm like, 
but the risers get more money than me you know so okay fine i don't this is something i don't want i don't want to be in a numbers industry and then after that so i was telling everyone that this is not the love that i want what did I get myself into i might as well become a lawyer or something oh my god oh so after that this is the truth yeah and then, so I was telling everyone, so one day my friend said, you know what, uh, Media Prima Rahat, which is, you know, our national Malaysian territory TVs, they are building up. So I threw my CV, so I got a job at the group CEO's office. I think because they read, like, wow, this girl started for us and I chatted content. It's an easy job to go, right? I got a job. So I was working for the group CEO as a special officer for three years. At that time, I know what I want. I love branding. I love marketing communication. Um, to a certain extent, I love investors relations because in the group CEO's office with 5,000 employees, so you, you have to deal with everyone. I love the creative part and then I'm like, okay, I like it. So I get my footing and after that I left, I was in, you know, Astro and whatever, blah, 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 blah. And then my last employment was with this company, Corey Berry. So, you know, they own, they own the Malaysia Reserve and the right for International New York Times for Malaysia. So I was the head of business development, blah, 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 blah. So I had to deal with, you know, the International New York Times people, we had a lot of events whereby we were organizing the Green Growth Roundtable, whatever, not 2012. I was privileged in the media because I could attend any events, you know, media class, right? So I attended the pre-launching of the Millennial Development Goal. Now it's called SDG 2012 with my best friend, Sarah. She's a chartered accountant, by the way. Um, she's working for the GLC company. So she's like, this is what we want to do. So I met someone, the keynote speaker, and she, she, her name is Mozik Maizan. She was wearing um, her T-shirt and her, her, her dress made for recycled plastic bottle throughout. So I'm like, are you serious? This is made for recycled plastic bottle. That was when I was exposed to it. And then she was asking me, what are you doing here, local girl? I said, oh, I'm from the media. I'm representing International New York Times major office to be here. And she was like, wow, you know, International New York Times. New York Times is a big brand around the world. She was talking to me. And then my best friend was like, you and I said that all this while we don't want to be employees anymore, right? No, I don't want to be employee anymore. This is crap. And you know what? My best friend was the one who's like, Susie, I can't skip my job, but you can. So why don't you go see Monique Maizan before she goes back to China and tell her that we want to partner with her and bring these, the first women and the first brand in Malaysia with recycled plastic bottle. You know what? That's exactly what I did the next day. I went to see her shangri -La, so I told her that, you know what? I want to talk to you, but in our country, I mean, people don't really know about plastic bottles. People don't know about fabric waste. People don't know many things. People confuse what sustainability, what CSR is. And then after that, guess what? That was in October 2012. January, February 2013, my best friend and I flew to China. I've never been to China before. Um, I don't, maybe one or two words of Mandarin. I, I understand more Cantonese. I went. Sarah went and I, and then we signed the deal. And then after that, the rest is three, seven years later. So, you know, many things happened since then. So to answer your question, how I got myself into this, it's the education system, low hanging fruit. I didn't want to study much. Accounting is the easiest thing amongst you to be an engineer, whatever not. I got myself in the top firm, but I was suffering because top firm, these are all pension A students, ICAW. I'm like, this is not why I want. I was like, I just want a degree. And the rest is. Oh, I don't know, Susie. Chartered accountant is not exactly. Is this, you know what? I don't I want to study those yeah. engineering stuff. That's just not me. I mean, you know. In accounting, it, contrary it to so popular fun. belief, there's some subject like organizational behavior, public sector accounting. These are all, you know, you read, it's not difficult to pass. That's the truth. <laughs> it's it's amazing that you say, I mean, chartered accountancy is easy. I, I I'm a chartered accountant. I, I, I graduated, but I did not I did not pursue my ACCA. I only took two papers. Oh, you did. My best friend, okay. Sarah, she's a chartered accountant, ACCA. Yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, but I, I relate to a lot of the story that you've told because um, my first degree and my second degree was actually computer engineering. Because <laughs> I was, you know, again, education system. Um, and you now can relate to what I said, right? I, I, I had that option, like, yes, you know, like exactly. off, but I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Very inspiring. All three of you have such brilliant stories. I mean, I just can't stop listening to you. It's just amazing. And, you know, um, that kind of segues into my third question for you, because uh, when you when you talk about, you know, your um, entrepreneurial journeys, 
setting up and running your own businesses is definitely not an easy task and it it can be and is actually a 24 by 7 full time job you know with it has its highs and it has its lows and it has its ups and downs um you know you've talked about your successes motivations and inspirations uh, i'm sure there have been times where you've you know you've kind of uh, had like taken a setback or there've been some challenges along the way so is there something that you would like to tell us about uh, you know some roadblocks that you faced and most importantly i mean of course apart from the the challenges that you faced but how did you actually overcome them you know what was your support group um how did you actually uh, take it step by step and at this at this phase maybe i would i would start with suzy again since you spoke last i mean let's go you know we saw the success and let's also hear about some challenges ah so continue the, the drama just now right got myself into the wrong degree got to the top <laughs> firm, always dozing off my boss was always angry i was in the media 10 years 7 years in media i find it fake like i do wake up in the morning for this you know that kind of stuff oh by the way i must uh, i must um tell you this a cloth was incorporated on 11 to after team that's the last sequence of your calendar year 11 of december 2018 so we we plan for that because that's that also means last hope Let's hope that I can be someone that I wanted to be. Yeah. So to answer your question, the challenges, the culprit is always myself. No one but me. You know, in anything that you do, I believe that you know. I used to blame like education system lah. I was young. I don't know much lah. Everything. I was just you know. But truth is that it's actually me. Yeah. If there's only one challenge, is um okay. But external factors. So it's okay. Fine. our psyche what we think what we feel is ours but if i were to talk about external factors um i always find it challenging because being a corporate um while media was you know regulated and also you know of course it's you know it's it's part of the government as well but waste management is another level whereby you know waste management policy is by the government you know as in like how we want to do things what i thought as a layman because i did i was i was not from this industry so i have my idea like which for thinking oh i can do this or oh, i can do that or oh, why is it is it very very easy to collect garbage no so it's not it's not like that so my number one is that again you know while is external where by you know waste is you know managed by you know government but again in a way is me because i do not understand you know the whole system the whole ecosystem i presumed um what else um okay challenges when you work for people you think you have the biggest problem on earth your boss is about to sack you right but trust me when you're entrepreneur you will see that oh my god just that forget a new job so um challenge is that is me again whereby i have fear like oh my god what if i if, you know when i first started with sarah we there's only two of us right and then what if i can't eat i don't have money oh my god and then when we start to start to hire people who have commitments oh my god what if i can't pay right it is all fear So how do I overcome that? I know this is cliche but it's true. I watch a lot of YouTube videos. I love watching interviews, you know, from Bill Gates to who? To Jennifer Lopez, everyone has their own story and if you, you know, regardless of who or where you are, what language, what industry, it's just the same. It's the story of hardship. So what I do is Every time when I feel that I question myself, you know what? You could have been an accountant, you know. You could have been a group CFO somewhere, a multinational or CEO somewhere, and you're busy collecting garbage. You know, every time I have that, you know that. You know, sometimes I get that. You know, come on, I won't lie. Um, I look at happiness in a different form. I tell myself, um, do I want that big room, um, the financial controller's room, or do I want happiness that I can be myself? So I again, the answer is that I talk to myself. I believe that many things in around us is all in the mind mind over matter thank you i think that's a good mantra to have mind over matter mind over matter mind over matter yes. <laughs> um topic is always thank you suzy that's that's kind of a complete story right like we went from your inspiration to challenges to you know to how you come uh, sort that out i'll move on with the same question to kiru and then to juliana tell me the exact same thing you know uh, what kind of challenges did you face when you set you know set up and how do you overcome those i mean as a startup i'm we're still in the early stages i would say um almost every day we face with challenges and um well i wouldn't say setbacks but challenges yes and um but we try to take it positively uh, i'm quite lucky because uh, i have a really good partner 
um, a business partner as well as a partner at home. So, um, you know, when we face these challenges, um, for example, if I'm feeling down, my business partner, she would be the one to, you know, boost my mood up and say like, oh, okay, it's all right. Let's look at it from a different angle and vice versa. So that's quite uh, important to have that support system. But aside from that, um, I also try to look at it from a positive angle. Um, you know, try to like, if, if you are facing something, like what else can you do with it? Um, and honestly, we are facing challenges. Um, we were supposed to have our official launch, but we have to delay it because of, um, you know, external issues. But we're trying to like get around it and do what we can in the meantime. So for me, I think it's a learning journey. Uh, I mean, Susie and Juliana, they are the experts in this. Like, you know, they, I'm the new kid on the block. So um, yeah, taking inspiration from all these ladies now. <laughs> Thanks, Kiru. And I, I've written this um, good partnerships. I mean, good partner at home, good business partner. I, that kind of is a support system that everybody needs. Uh, so I've got mind over matter, good partnerships. And now I'll go to Juliana to learn something about how you've coped, whether you've faced any challenges at all and how you've coped with that. Yeah, for, for sure we face challenges. But before I go into that, I just wanted to, um, you know, reiterate whatever Susie just mentioned just now, you know, as an entrepreneur, really you wake up every day. So, sometimes you struggle and you wake up every day and like, how am I going to pay myself, or my, my team members and all that? And that's the, it's a whole different kind of stress level as being uh, an employee. So yeah, that one's, a, I think, an ongoing struggle that we all going to have to face through that. Um, but for BTBC, I guess like one of the greater challenges that we have had was actually a few years ago um, when we had to make a decision to actually shut down one of our services pipelines. Um, this was the art, waste art installation pipeline. Uh, it was a business decision that had to be made uh, because we were not able to scale that department um, to be aligned with our current company's, uh, sorry, our company's current direction. Uh, it was super stressful. Um, you know, it wasn't a it wasn't an easy decision to come to. Um, it was like definitely one of the hardest conversations that we have had, um, especially because that meant like a number of our team members within that department had to be let go. Um, you know, it, it definitely was like a, a very tough uh, conversation, tough decision. And, uh, you know, thankfully everyone was really supportive and understood the reasons behind it. And I think the key to that was because we were really trying our best to have complete transparency with everyone, especially with the teams that are involved. Um, you know, just telling them like uh, exactly what's happening, why can't we, uh, you know, grow this department or why can't we uh, inject more funds into it and those kind of things, um, you know, and I think that really helped. Uh, and what we did also was to come up with like specific plans for each of these individuals that are being let go so that we don't just leave them hanging uh, we, you know, we do give them packages and then we also give them like uh, training, uh, training workshops and things like that just to upskill them and also reintegrate them into the workforce. And uh, we try our best to connect them with like, different organizations as well uh, so that they have uh, a second chance um, beyond BGPG. So um, it was definitely a tough uh, lesson for us uh, as the company leaders to really keep our pipelines lean so as not to stretch our resources too much, um, which actually right now uh, we've been pretty good at it. Uh, we've learned how to actually focus on our key pipelines, um, growing this and, and, and you know, putting in uh, more effort into this to create the larger impact that we're actually aiming for. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, I think, by far one of the largest uh, challenges uh, that I have had to face with BGBG and that has also like grown me as a person as well. That's, uh, that's excellent. Thank you for sharing that, uh, you know, that tough decision that you have to make about shutting down an apartment, uh, a department and you had to, of course, uh, as an entrepreneur, you have to, you know, think about the teams that you have. It's you're not an employee anymore. You kind of, uh, you own a team or, you know, you have a team that you need to support and uh, it, it can be hard. And so I'm, I'm happy that you, you know, you were able to have solutions in place, like retraining them, uh, reintegrating them into the workforce. That's, that's really kind. I mean, usually many workforces don't do that. Um, so, you know, you guys have given us like the whole gamut of experience of from like starting out motivation, inspiration to challenges and to, and how you overcame them. Uh, before I open up the floor to, uh, to our participants, I'd like you, um, you know, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about, 
you know, what would you tell people now starting out on their own journeys? Uh, something that you might tell a youngest version of yourself. So, you know, what would you tell your younger self? Uh, what kind of things would you keep in mind? Suppose you were starting out today. Uh, and so this is for our participants and then I'll open, open up the floor. Maybe I begin with Juliana since you spoke last, uh, you know, you can kind of take your story further. Okay. Um, if I were to advise my, my professional self uh, from the beginning years of BGBG, um, I would tell myself to not underestimate the power of branding. Uh, and I think this goes like, uh, in, it goes hand in hand with like uh, what Gunilla has been, has spoken about before and also like Susie and Q, your backgrounds as well, right? Um, the whole key about communications. Um, to be honest, BGBG, we've never actually really spent so much resources on marketing and communications up until a few years ago. Uh, we've been pretty lucky in the first earlier years uh, because somehow our brand grew organically and the clients were putting in recommendations for us and that's how our business grew. But if I really could do things differently, I would definitely put in more effort into the whole branding and marketing side of things. Um, you know, it'll, it'll not only help in like spreading the environmental awareness that we're aiming for, but actually it helps on the funding side of things as well, getting the business in. Uh, so that's super important, especially when you're starting up. Um, and also like, uh, you know, I, I see a lot of other social enterprises and uh, environmental organizations, NGOs and things like that, not putting in uh, as much effort as they should be when it comes to uh, building their digital presence or building their um, their brand and things like that uh, because they're always so focused on their on-ground work, um, which is fine. But then I would really advise uh, these organizations and also if anyone here wants to start up your own um, organization, pay a bit more attention to branding and marketing. Um, you know, tell your stories, uh, exactly what Susie has been doing, right? That inspiring people with her stories. It's just everyday kind of things, what you've been going through and things like that. And that really will help your brand. And that's that's one of the greatest lessons I've learned uh, recently. Thanks, Julian. I think that's an extremely important lesson you're saying, uh, to, tell, to be able to tell a story of, you know, of what we're doing right now in this platform kind of to be able to tell the world why you started and what's your mission and where you want to take, you know, how you want to take it forward and so on. Uh, that's super important. And now I'd go to the new kid on the block, as she's called herself, uh, Kiru, to, uh, to, to tell us something that you might tell just, you know, a version of yourself five years prior to starting Eco Queen. I think if I was speaking to myself five years ago, I would be like, if you think of something, if you have an idea and you think strongly about it, you think you'll be able to do, bring a change, just do it. Don't overthink it. Um, I have been told I am an overthinker. Um, and I think that is, uh, you know, the reason why you lose motivation. You, you think of too many things and you just lose it. So don't do it. Just do it. Do your research, of course. Um, don't be shy to ask people um, for advice. Um, I, I just realized, especially of late, there is just so many um, different options to, re to resources uh, for you to like develop yourself. If you want to start a business, there's so many groups online on Facebook and people are just so uh, willing to share um, their information. You know, back in the days, you would think that people are so, uh, they, they want to hold on to all the trade secrets per se, but it's not, it's not the case. And everyone is uh, there to help you. Um, so yeah, if you have an idea, if you feel like you want to start something, do your research and then just do it. Um, don't waste time. Yeah. That's wonderful. It's funny that I just a few few days ago, I heard something. Uh, I don't think I'm saying it correctly, but it's about you regret things that you didn't do more than you regret things that you did do. So it's it's like, if you if you think it, do it, don't overthink it kind of thing. Uh, thanks, uh, Kiru. That's uh, insightful. And now I go to Susie. Uh, Susie, what would you tell a younger self? Maybe uh, to have not studied ac accounting? I don't know. What would you? I understand. Oh, sorry, I wrote it down, by the way, because this is a serious question to me because you can't turn yeah. back time. You see? That's right. So I like I, I totally agree what Juliana said. There's not brand, definitely. In the end, brand is how many people know you and also, you know, what is it they have in mind? What is the takeaway about you, right? So I agree 100 percent on the same page. I also agree uh, with Kiru whereby, you know, overthinking, that's right. In the end, please remember, we only have 24 hours a day. If you're just thinking for five hours, um, what about the rest of the day, right? So you're not moving. So you'll be stagnant or, you know, you'll be dormant. So, but this is my version. 
So what would I tell my younger self? Number one, if you have a dream, it's a little bit like Iru, just start, but with baby steps. Never try, never know. Number two, a good team is a key. There is no such thing as working alone. If you're working alone and you're telling me you have an NGO social enterprise, you're lying. This is one profession. You can't work alone, okay? Number three. This is a grave mistake I've done. Listen. Appoint advisors or get advice from subject matter expert. Okay? This is very serious. Studied accounting. I was in the media. Okay, so that's fine. I know Jack about waste management. I know Jack about carbons. I know Jack about many things, okay? Just cut the crap. Stop buying handbags. Stop buying expensive restaurant. Invest as well. Invest on the best advisors because they will tell you. Next. Um, okay, this is very important. Don't work with people you don't trust. Or if you do, ensure again you have your, law, your lawyers around you because it will all go to waste if you're working with untrustworthy people. Next. This is something like Juliana, but in a little bit different. Um, be clear when communicating with others and be honest. So your brand, you know, you have to communicate. You have to be clear because in the end, if your brand only you understand, then don't waste time, okay? But you might as well be at home watch Netflix. You have to be clear. Last but not least, rejection is normal, Susie, young Susie. Move on and try other ways. So that's exactly what I was going to tell myself. That's a great list, Suri, and I've taken notes. Uh, I'm sure people have taken notes as well. And I think this is a great, uh, I think, great time to open up the question, the floor to questions from participants, because I, I'm sure people have, uh, you know, questions of their own. So, uh, participants, if you have the option, please raise your hands. I don't know if you have that option within your Zoom. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your questions by yourself, or. Uh, alternatively, you may type your questions in the chat box. I think we have a few already, or uh, do I see any? Um, don't be shy. Nobody bites. I think this is such a great uh, set of panelists here we have today. And so if you're any of you thinking about these uh, kind of entrepreneurial questions or decisions, go ahead and ask, rack their brains. You know, these are the experts you're looking for. Um, do I see any questions? I, I see a hand raised. I see George. Uh, George, go ahead. Unmute yourself and ask him. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you for these uh, wonderful stories. Uh, I'm calling on behalf of Women Awaits of ISWA. We're interested to know uh, if the entrepreneurs have easy access to uh, green funds yeah, for their business. Is it, is it available in Malaysia or is it easy for them to find out uh, good, uh, good funding systems for sustainable uh, businesses from international funds? How easy is it and do they know about them? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, George. Um, Who would like to take that question? Um, any, any of you? One of you? Can answer that? Susie, do you want to go? Yeah, yeah go for it. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you talk about funding in Malaysia for green, yes, but as you know, green is one word. So, which part of green? If you talk about research, research green funds, there are a lot. Okay, as you know, Malaysia produces a lot of you know PhDs and you know master holders, whatnot. Research, yes. If you talk about pre-commercialization grants, yes. But if you talk about ready commercial, neither here nor there, if you talk about, to my point of view, I may be wrong, okay, this is my point of view, if you talk about circular economy and ESG per se as like ESG, I don't think so. It's usually that we have to always look for international grants that matches what we want. Like for instance, I'll give example, fabric, plastic, textile, circular economy. I have not one, I've not found one by Malaysian or no, never. Is that my answer? International grants, of course. It's, yeah. And it's easy accessible for us as well because, you know, we are not like, you know, we are not Swedish, whatever, not whereby, you know, a lot of grants goes to Malaysians, go to Thais, go to, you know, Indonesia. So, yeah, it's not difficult. And I would like to add. Susie. To yeah, go ahead, Juliana. Um, yeah, so, so I do agree with Susie. Uh, when it comes to research and like, uh, you know, the yeah, research kind of grants is a lot, but when it comes to social enterprises and all that, we don't, I guess we don't really do so much research kind of work. It's, it's really like uh, the on-ground implementing kind of stuff that we do. And those kind of uh, grants or funds is pretty hard to get come by. Even if there are, they're all in small amounts, which kind of 
defeats the purpose also anyway. Um, but there are like a couple of foundations who uh, based in Malaysia who do give out such grants. But then again, also, if it's only like, you know, if, if it's less than five, you're definitely going to run out of that, right? You, you can't be, be dependent on that so, so much. So for BGBG, we do work with like uh, certain foundations. Um, we also do work with embassies, but not, I mean, like, you know, US embassies in Malaysia, British councils and things like that. But, you know, local, local foundations, local uh, companies that want to give out funds, not so much. Very small. Yeah, we're looking to scale Thank you. up we'd love to get some funds. <laughs> Do let us know if you know of where we can head to. No, with, with, I mean, I think with this COP26 coming up with the IPCC report last week and the, the discussions around ESG, as, as uh, Susie referred to as well, uh, more reporting standards coming, you know, companies complying with these reporting standards and so on. It might happen that these funds start to increase as well within the countries. Of course, international funding that you talked about uh, you can access as well, but then it, as Susie said, it gets kind of diluted to different countries, not just Malaysia. To add up, yeah? If um, you talk about publicity mm -hmm. promotion grants, there's a lot in our country. But if you talk about, mm -hmm. like, you know, now we talk about full-fledged circular economy of building the value chain, there's none. Because to, to build a yeah. value chain, that will stay what is defined by ESG. I'm not able to solve that. That's the truth. Not yet, not yet. Not yet. Okay. I mean, ESG is a, is a relatively new uh, discussion as well, no? Like worldwide, more people are getting over onto it. Um, I hope I hope that changes. So thank you for your answer. I do see another question in the in the chat box. I think I'm just going to read it out because uh, she's not she hasn't raised her hand. And um, if it's okay, uh, Charmaine, I'm going to read out your question. She says hello. Thank you all so much for the sharing. It was all super informative and helpful. My question is, since the recycling industry is not necessarily the most profitable, how do you ensure that your organization achieves financial sustainability or make sure, makes enough revenue to pay yourselves and your employees? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think I'll give it to all of you, starting with Susie. Susie, you've got like the longest uh, history in this. So. Okay. Do you know that everything that you see around you, be it for plastic, be it for fabric, be it for aluminum, has high value? Do you know that aluminum can cost a, um, for... A, okay, I'll give you an example. PET bottle, your drinking water bottle, PET, it's about um, 30 cents per kilogram. Do you know that? So while, you know, from our minds, like we thought that, you know, there's, there's no recycling value, that's actually not true. You know, like there's a lot of billionaires <laughs> who are collecting garbage because like I said, why is it that you're talking about waste management and circular economy? So it's because there's value to waste. That's why we're talking about converting that into a formal economy. So number one is, actually there's a lot of money, but there's a but to it. Because we are newbies, we are not concessionaires, okay? We are... Um, social enterprise. So that's a little bit tricky. That's right. I want you to know that cloth has been running since 2013 until 2021. I don't get, Sarah don't get, cloth doesn't get a cent of grants or anything at all. We run 100% commercial. Let me tell, tell something why. Number one is that, you know, personally, I have to tell you this is because it's ego. Okay. It does not make sense that I am a social enterprise, but I leave for the first five years of my company in cooperation with Sarah with grants. And I'm talking here about circular economy. Circular economy means generating income. So yeah, so, so that's my answer, pretty much. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you, Susie. I'll uh, pass it on to also Juliana, just to, you know, since you're also in the space, to say something about that. I completely agree with Susie. Uh, there is a lot of value of all the waste that we see around us. It's, it's such a shame that we're calling it waste. I think we just need to re-term that, that, that word waste, right? Um, and, and that's exactly the problem also, because everyone sees it as having no value, especially the people who's giving out funds, right? So that's where we want to change their mind saying like, okay, when you um, commission us to run like awareness programs or to, to you know, get our communities to be making or recycling new things and all that, there is a certain fee to it. And this is why it's charged that way, because there's a lot of resources that goes into it, a lot of work that goes into it, like, you know, the cleaning and the sorting because the people don't want to clean at home. And that's one of the issues, right? So I, I really think it's all in the education form of things to teach people about the value of waste. And that's what we aim to be doing under BGBG. Um, 
But to answer your question, like how do we sustain ourselves, right? If, if people are saying like, you know, there's no, not enough money and things like that, uh, we just have to be smart and creative about things. Um, so like, you know, if, if you are working on, on recycling, you do need to understand or like position yourself with the, your funders or with your corporate clients, um, understanding what do they actually want to achieve. If they want their brand to be seen as like, uh, you know, um, people in the circular economy and things like that, like what can you uh, offer for them? Um, you know, it could be a campaign, it could be like, a, you know, a, 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 not a buyback, but like a return back your plastic bottles kind of thing. And then like, uh, you know, it could be a co-branding sort of things and you can charge for that. Um, so yeah, I, I, that would be my answer, I guess. Thank you, thank you, Juliana. Um, Kiru, I don't know, do you want to also um, say something here or you're also looking for sustainability in your business when you launch it? Yeah, so I think for, for I mean, obviously this question is not so relevant to us, but um, what we want to do is like what Juliana said, is to um, create awareness and to encourage people. And one of the things that we, we um, as um, in our business model, what we want to do is encourage uh, plastic-free um, delivery of items. So, you know, in a way, like just starting that, educating uh, the consumers to really change their mindset. So, yeah, that's kind of my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I understand we're coming very close to the finish line of our uh, webinar. So, um, I'll take the last question, which is here from uh, Aprilia and Nadia to everybody. And she says, Thank you, Kiru, Julie, and Susie, for sharing your experience. I would like to ask, uh, she has an intention of creating a recycling business as uh, the social enterprise in, uh, at a community level. Um, so her question is, how do you convince uh, the investor since it's, it's in the middle of a global pandemic? Um, she found uh, looking for funding is quite hard since waste management uh, you know, is not a priority. At least people perceive it as not a priority during a global pandemic. So um, any of you who would like to start? Yeah, uh, oh, no. yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is exactly what uh what what we do as well and um exactly the kind of challenge that we face uh so when we apply for for funding when it comes to um like you said recycling business within a community level uh we understand that the funders their current focus right now i would say is more on building the community so this is where we try to involve the community as much as possible in the recycling uh, aspect of things. So if for us, for, for, for you, if you want to start on your social enterprise to have a recycling business, um, try to think of how you can involve the community to be uh, within that business. So maybe you can hire them uh, as your recyclers, as your uh, plastic shredders and those kind of things. So using your community as your, um, I guess, supply chain and proving to the, your funders that when you fund my project, you're not only funding me, but you're also helping out the communities. Um, and and that, that I feel has been very useful in terms of like, uh, you know, just changing a narrative to, to ensuring uh, you're meeting what the clients or your funders want. And also you still get to, uh, you know, get the impact that you actually want as well. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. So since we are short of time, we have two minutes. Um, I want to ask you all, all three of you, for any last thoughts, take home messages for the participants. Is there something more you'd like to say that you haven't already said? Um, let me begin with Kiru. Um, well, if it's going to be uh, a take home message to someone who's um, planning to start a business, um, uh, I would say just don't waste time, just go ahead and do it. Um, um, and if you do have a plan, always have plan B. That's my message. Wonderful. Wonderful. So it's like, don't waste time. Uh, start immediately and always have a plan B. I think very, very sane and sound advice. Uh, um, I'd like to go to Susie next. Any take home messages? Last, last thing that you'd like to say? <clears throat> I think, okay, um, don't waste time. Um, you, of course, you need to have a good partner. You need to write down. You need to write a lot of emails, whatever, not so that that's cliche. But um, I like that question just now about investors. I think, well, investors is good, but investors are also the reason why you're going to give up. Because when you give up your equities to your investors, they have control for your company, on your company. If they are not from the same industry like yours and you're only looking after money, you're not going to make it. 
this is not like buying a technology. This is, if you're talking about like me, like, you know, like a bit crazy, right? Like, you know, I don't want to be media, I don't want to be a counter, whatever, not, I just want to collect garbage. Maybe that is something. Just need to be at 3,000 ringgit. All you need to do is run a community program. You don't need any investors. Just collect and then sell it to the recyclers. And the recyclers will buy your, the garbage that you collect, the immediately cash. Recycling is a cash business. So when people tell me that, I want to raise funds for blah, blah. I'm like, you collect the garbage like me. So why do you need 1 million ringgit? You're not buying facilities. I don't understand. So, you know, from accounting part, part as well, and also brand. So that was something that I know. Do not look for investors un unless if that invest those investors are your family members who loves you. You do not have, you do not lose control of your company because when other people have control, because you know what? Social enterprise is about what you believe. You have to start with something what you believe, not what your investors, your, finan your financiers tell you. I don't agree with that. So to my point of view, first thing is you got to believe in what you want. I just do it without anyone dictating you. Once you build that, then only you talk about investors, grants, whatever not. So that's, that's all. Valuable input by an accountant. Remember that, guys. Remember that. You know, uh, she's talking about equity. And once you don't own your equity or whatever you like to call it in accounting, then you're kind of giving up little control of your company. Don't so, give up your control. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's an important message. Uh, and Juliana, last thoughts? Um, actually, very similar along the lines with uh, Kiru. Um, I feel like if you want to make a difference, but you don't know where to start, start with yourself. You know, start small, but, you know, the most important thing is just start somewhere and starting with yourself is the easiest thing to do. Wow. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for inspiring us with your stories and for doing what you do on a daily basis. Um, we all wish you all uh, like a lot of success and uh, hopefully your business will continue to grow and grow. Thank you, participants, for your valuable questions and for being such a great audience uh, today. And for me, at least, uh, the take home, uh, the take home message has been through the discussions that we all need to keep reminding ourselves that as individual consumers, because each, each speaker said this, we are powerful and that our choices have an impact. Uh, so collectively, small actions that we do on a daily basis can have an enormous impact. And that brings me back to the, to the start of the, the panel discussion that we had today, that we had the IPCC report come out last week, and what can we all do? So we start with ourselves. It's, of course, much easier said than done, but I will keep reminding myself uh, as I go along. So thank you once again. Take care of yourselves and see you next time.